Do 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 do. Ba 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 ba. Da da da. Hello. Hey, look who's here. So I'm um, I'm in a different time zone than usual. Sorry, my coffee with Scott Adams is a little bit late. But you know what goes well with lateness? I think you do. What goes well with lateness is coffee with Scott Adams. Might be a little late for you. Doesn't matter. So, um, some uh, I saw some news today about Dennis Rodman going to Singapore. But the article said two completely opposite things. So the, the headline said, Dennis Rodman's going to go to Singapore for the, the summit. And then you read it and it says, his manager says he's not made any, made any plans to go to Singapore. It's one of those two things. So I want to read you a tweet from the Ayatollah Khamenei. That's probably the worst pronunciation of that you've ever heard. All right. So this is from... Uh, the leader of Iran, Khamenei. And I think it's funny that he tweets. Uh, he, so he's got an English language Twitter feed in addition to his Arabic language one and probably a Farsi. But anyway, he said, uh, I think it was a couple days ago, he says, our stance against Israel is the same stance we have always taken. Israel is a malignant cancerous tumor in the West Asian region that has to be removed and eradicated, colon, it is possible and it will happen. Now, you think that's a fake tweet? I don't think so. He's got half a million followers. I'm pretty sure that's his real. Um, so you think he quoted himself from 1991? Well, in any, in any event, it's a, it's a current tweet, so he's reinforcing his point that Israel, and the wording is important here, so this is the, the English language version of it. He says uh, that Israel has to be removed and eradicated. It is possible and it will happen. Now, here's what I would do. If I were Nikki Haley, President Trump, Mike Pompeo, if I was them, I would do the following thing. I would ask him to clarify. No, nobody gets bad if you ask them to clarify, right? Because there's a little bit of ambiguity and there might be a translation thing, etc. But I would like to see Khamenei say to the world, what does he mean that Israel has to be removed and eradicated? Does that mean, now you're probably saying to yourself, well, that's pretty obvious what that means, but is it? Does it mean that all the people must be killed? Does it mean that the name Israel must be changed to something else and become more inclusive rather than a, a Jewish uh, state, per se? You know, w would that be an example of eradicated? If they just evolved to a different form that, you know, let's say included more Palestinians? Would Iran say, yes, we won? We eradicated Israel. That old Israel doesn't exist anymore. Now we've got this, this new entity that's included some extra um, extra land. Would that make him happy? No, I don't know. Now, I know what you're saying. Yeah, so somebody's saying, is eradicated not clear? And here's the thing. I believe it's intentionally unclear. And asking him to clarify it would be a huge step forward. Because would he go in front of the world and say, let me be specific. Eradicate means they all have to be killed. Would he say that? I don't think he'd say that. Would he say, well, I'm not going to clarify? If he doesn't clarify, well, then you have to imagine that it is the worst case scenario and act, act as if that's true. Now, if you're Israel, you're always going to act like it's the worst case scenario because that's the smart thing to do, which is essentially what they do. But suppose you said to the, uh, you said to Khamenei, what if there was a regional deal in which the Palestinians were satisfied that they got something they can live with? It might not be the ideal situation, 
Maybe there's no right of return. Maybe there's a little bit in special cases. Maybe some of those people get paid off. But whatever it is, do you think there's any situation that would make Khamenei um, happy? <laughs> is there anything that would make him happy that does not include exterminating the individuals who live in, in Israel? Could it be just a system change? Could it be a long-term evolution to something different? Uh, so the power of this is that I think we would first be surprised if he were asked to clarify. Because you can say, here's, here's the thing, you can say in public, yeah, I, I think I want to eradicate that state, because here's the beauty of that. The beauty from a um, from an Iranian point of view, not our point of view, but the beauty of that is everybody's going to see what they expect to see. So you saw that a number of you, as soon as I said eradicate, a number of you said, "Well, isn't that obvious? You know it exactly what that means. It's the Holocaust, and it might be exactly what they mean. But if you ask them to clarify, are they going to clarify and say, "Yeah, we're we're really talking about another Holocaust." That's the only thing that'll make us happy? I don't think they will. Here's why. If they clarified it that way, they would be vaporized fairly quickly, I think. <laughs> I mean, it would, you know, that, that's a, an exaggeration. They wouldn't be vaporized right away, but we would stop worrying about negotiating. We would just treat it like a current mortal military threat we would shut down their economy, we would starve them out, we'd bomb whatever needs to be bombed, if that's what they said. But suppose, but suppose he didn't say that. Suppose he said, well, we're not being specific, you know, God works in many ways, we just want the situation to be resolved, and we'd like it to be resolved in a way that Israel no longer is a threat to us, and is no longer a threat in our opinion, to, let's say, anybody else in the region, Palestinians, folks in Gaza, that sort of thing. Which way do you think he'd go? Now, independent of what you think is his real purpose, how do you think he would clarify? And I want to see your comments. How many of you think he would clarify in public that he really means killing everybody in Israel? How many think he would say, well, it's more of a, we need a deal where everybody's happy situation, and you know maybe maybe Israel includes more Palestinians in the state, something like that. So I'm just looking at your um, your answers. So some say he won't clarify, and you might be right. He doesn't want a deal. Some say he does want a deal. Um. He won't stoop to clarifying. Well, it's not really stooping because we would ask him for his opinion. <laughs> Somebody saying, uh, Adams, you, you effing idiot. Why is it that everybody calls me an idiot when they don't understand what I'm saying? Well, I suppose it's the same reason my dog thinks I'm an idiot. So, <laughs> now, let me... <laughs> so, somebody says, seriously cringeworthy. But you don't know where I'm going with this yet. Think of the possibilities once we've asked them to, cl to clarify. One possibility is that they refuse to clarify, which is a clarification, isn't it? If, if they refuse to clarify, then it means the worst case scenario. And it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if anybody disagrees with you, you have to treat it like it's the worst case scenario. And it's also a free pass after that point. Because right now the world is looking and the world is saying, hey, let's work something out. But if you ask Iran, they say, no, the, there's no working this out. Doesn't matter how long it takes. Doesn't matter how much it costs us in terms of, you know, pain in Iran. We're just going to make sure that everybody in Israel is killed. So they can either say that directly, in which case you've got a free pass to do whatever you want, or they can not if they can refuse to clarify, in which case you can still you have a free pass because a refusal to clarify is the same as saying you want to kill everybody. But what if they said, look, if we had a comprehensive deal, we could talk about that. 
wouldn't that get you closer to knowing at least what your options are? Because I feel right now they don't have um, they don't have any pressure on them to clarify what would make them happy. So here's the here's the better way to describe it. Describe an end state that is both possible and you're the only thing that you'll settle for. And it would be interesting to uh, to see what they did with that. All right. Um, this would never ever have been a conversation in 2013. Maybe not. What about death to America? Well, you know, Iran has been saying death to America for a long time. But if you imagined th this won't happen, but if you imagined that the United States pulled its support for Israel and just got out of the region and, and legitimately just just got out of there, would Iran still be saying death to America? I don't think so. I think we would be out of sight, out of mind at that point. So I think we're owed a clarification, and no matter which way it goes, it gives us more information and we, we'd have a, a plan. Now keep in mind that the, the cleverness, I think I missed my, my main point, so let me, let me back up to it. The Iranian people themselves are also looking at this language about eradicating Israel. And I believe that because it could be interpreted in different ways, I think the Iranian population is thinking, Oh, maybe maybe he doesn't mean that really literally, the ones who don't want it to happen. But the ones who do want it to happen, you know, maybe it's 20% of the hardliners, you know, maybe it's less, maybe it's more, I have no idea. But the people who do want it to happen also hear, oh, it's going to be, it's on now. It's eradication now. So everybody's hearing what they want to, want to hear. How about we ask Iran to clarify it to its own public? What if we ask the Ayatollah, look, you know, do us a favor and at least clarify it to your own people what that means and, and what kinds of outcomes would be acceptable. Because if their public hears with no ambiguity that their plan is to eradicate Israel, how long are they going to sit there waiting to be destroyed? Because because that, that plan would get them to... Um, an all bad situation in Iran. Now, whether or not Israel also uh, suffered some major catastrophe from, uh, from an attack, the, the Iranian citizens would have to know that their leader just set them up to be wiped out. Now, that doesn't mean they would be, but they'd have to start thinking about it at that point. So here's my, here's my view. If Iran doesn't clarify you have to assume it's the worst case scenario, in which, in which case, screw everybody. We don't care about anybody else's opinion at that point. You know, at that point, it's just war. And let's treat it that way. Um, and if they say, no, we really mean eradication and we'll stop at nothing, well, that's the same thing too. And then it's just war and there's just no, there's no point in even talking. But if they say, well, we'd be flexible, then at least their own population would have a reason not to revolt. Because it seems to me that the Iranian public is getting close to the end of their patience with their own leadership. And if their leadership would simply clarify their plans for or their preferences for Israel, the Iranian public would know their future. If the leader clarifies that they really want to do wipe out uh, Israel and actually literally kill all the people, or if they refuse to clarify, then, then we help them clarify and say, okay, the lack of clarifying only means one thing. Iranian public, your, your, uh, your leader just gave you a death sentence. Because that's what it would be. Doesn't mean it's today, doesn't mean it's next week, but if that's what their leadership if the only thing that would be happy is that, it's a death sentence to the Iranian people. They should know that. So they have a choice of, let's say, alternatives. I realize it's not a democracy. It's also not a stable, uh, not a stable country. 
So there are enough young people in Iran who are restless and have been born into a world that's a bad economy and an imperfect situation. Uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not a situation about voting the leader out of power. They have options. But it's not our business. I, I would be mostly concerned that the Iranian people know what they're signing up for. If they keep their leadership in power and their leadership clarifies that they want to kill all the people in Israel, then I don't think they have any future, the Iranian public, and that would be an enormous tragedy. Um, so let's, let's ask for a clarification, see where it gets us. Um, the, somebody's saying that the religious doctrine is what's capturing the the imaginations of the young. Well, that may be true, but I'm hearing the opposite. So, you know, I'm not sure we ever know what's happening in other countries. Why won't you talk about California? Okay, I'll talk about California. So apparently we have, um, so this somebody named Cox uh, is gonna be running against uh, Kimberly Guilfoyle's ex, uh, what's his name? I forget. Um, and the Democrats gonna win, and what else is there to say about that? Yeah, the, um, oh, Gavin Newsom, yeah. My understanding is that the Republican is not, um, I hate to say this, it's not what you wanna hear. My understanding is that the the Republican candidate is not strong enough that that I would get involved in trying to negotiate or or not negotiate but trying to persuade. Yeah, he's he's Trump's pick, but that's because he's a Republican. You know, re remember, being Trump's pick doesn't mean he's the best candidate. So I, th I think you know there's just not much to say about. California. I think Gavin Newsom's going to get his shot. And, um, well, Travis Allen is out already, right? It's just the, the two finalists who run. There's down ticket help from Cox being there. Yeah, maybe. Hmm. All right. Giuliani actually said that North Korea was begging on hands and knees. I hope that's not true. Did he really say that? Can somebody confirm? And is that recent? Is that something he just said? Because if it is, uh, uh, seriously. Oh my God. Well, that's a firing offense, in my opinion. I, I think he's... Um, I like Giuliani, but if he really said that, I don't know, that feels like a firing offense. Um, yeah, he's he has not been nailing it lately. He seems to have been causing more problems than he's fixing right now. Uh, so somebody on here just said that Giuliani said that North Korea came begging for the summit on their hands and knees. If he really said that, uh, that that's not good team play. Let's put it that way. Um, I hope he didn't say that. Could be fake news. The Wall Street Journal reports it. I know. I, I never. I don't a hundred percent trust the news that I see in my comment feed here. <laughs> Fox News said he said it. Oh, God. That is so bad. So when people ask me, uh, the biggest criticism that I ever get on Twitter, I think it's the most common one, is that people say, anything Trump does, you will say is, is genius. But... He hired Giuliani, and that's not working out. I, I can't, I can't, I can't sit here and tell you. Well, that sure was a good thing. I mean, based on what we see, we don't know if Giuliani is is actually doing a 
It's possible, it's likely, that we don't know what's really happening behind the scenes, who he's negotiating with, who who was his high school friend that really makes a difference because he can talk to him. You know, there's probably a whole bunch of stuff that Giuliani can bring to this that we don't know about. But if you're if you're uh, basing it on his public appearances, um, he's just screwed the pooch about three times in a row now, and I, I would get him off camera at the very least. Um, so somebody said they can't find a reference to the remark. So let's call this a uh, an unconfirmed <laughs> an unconfirmed thing that a number of you think is true. That's that's all I know right now. I'm not the one who can confirm it. So a number of you are saying it is confirmed, and it's more likely that you're right than wrong. So it's just that I can't I can't confirm it personally. Um, yeah, I am in Amsterdam right now. Just took a stroll through the city. By the way, uh, so uh, since I'm I'm in a city where this is completely legal, I can tell you this story. So one of the things that you need to do when you go to Amsterdam, besides walking through the red light district and looking at uh, women in the window and saying, yeah, it's just like they said. Sure, I mean, there's not much to it except you walk by and go, oh yeah, it's just like the pictures. There's a live woman in the window. So that, that part was sort of underwhelming, but it's one of those necessary things you have to walk through that area. Um, but the other thing, of course, is they have these coffee shops. They call them coffee shops in which they they sell marijuana products. And you can smoke it there, or I think you're not allowed to smoke it outdoors, but you know there, there's not much enforcement of anything like that here. So I stopped in last night, and I got a little confused on the menu. And so I said, hey, I'll have, I'll have this joint. So he hands me a joint and there's, there's a little sort of a smoking room in there, just has a, you know, a, a door to keep the smoke in, I guess. And there's only one other person in there because it was 10.30 at night. And so I go in and I light it up and took a few hits on it. And I, I started tripping so bad that I didn't know if I'd be able to make it back to my hotel, which was all of a block and a half away. Like I, I thought I was, losing my mind and uh, and I thought holy hell what kind of special marijuana do they have in this place because uh, I don't like to brag but I built up a little tolerance over the years and I certainly would not expect somebody who's been living on California weed to have any kind of a trouble handling the the uh, the Netherlands variety but here's what I didn't know Here's what I didn't know. I ordered the wrong thing off the menu. Whoops. I thought I was smoking a joint. Whoops. It wasn't. It did have marijuana in it, but it was a tobacco uh, slash marijuana joint. And uh, if you have never, yes, if you have never experienced the combination of, and I'm not a cigarette smoker, uh, but I also don't have a sense of smell. So I, you know, anybody else would have immediately known what it was. I think they just would have smelled it. But I, I lost my sense of smell years ago. So I fire this thing up, and um, I had heard this before, that the combination of tobacco and marijuana just gives you this wild, immediate rush high. Yeah, it makes you dizzy. And um, I walked outside, and this this is a true story. And I it, there was still a little. Uh, I don't. I only smoked like less than maybe a quarter inch of it, something like that. And I walked outside, and I was just going to put it out on the the sidewalk on the curb, and I couldn't find the ground. I'm not even kidding. I couldn't find the ground. Like I. Uh, you know, getting getting her from here to the you know three feet down to the ground, 
I kept, I kept stumbling and I, I almost fell into a canal. True story. So I won't be trying that again. So if you ever go to Amsterdam and somebody talks you into buying a joint at the coffee shop, uh, I recommend that you read the menu carefully and make sure you're not getting the combo tobacco slash marijuana. Uh, I didn't get sick, but I also only had, you know, a, a little bit of it, but it just about took my head off. I don't recommend it at all. You know, e even if you think, oh, that sounds good, it's very powerful. It wasn't powerful in any kind of a good way. Um, I understand that people like it, but definitely not my thing. They have edibles. I would never touch edibles, by the way. So edibles is where all the problems happen. The, the people who don't understand marijuana always make rookie mistakes. Here's some rookie mistakes with marijuana. Number one, not knowing that there's a difference between the two major um, types that really, tr that really have a different effect. And number two, not knowing that there's a pretty big difference within each category uh, of what strain you're getting and what kind of effects you get. Some will make you more paranoid, some will make you more creative, some wake you up, some put you to sleep. They're, they're opposites in many ways. So if you don't know at least that much, you're just putting some mystery thing into your body that may or may not be anything like what you were hoping for. So that's one of them. The other myth is that vaping is safer. Uh, you've seen the, the vape things that turn the marijuana into uh, uh, sort of a, uh, a vapor of water and THC, I guess. And it might be, it's possible that it's safer, but I would never I would never use that as my main go-to because unlike regular marijuana that people have been burning and smoking in the normal way for decades and decades, the vaping hasn't really been studied. And it also lacks a lot of the CBDs and the, and the things that might be offering the protective quality of the marijuana. So people who smoke, the, the studies on it have shown that they have the same mortality as people who don't smoke marijuana, that is, not cigarettes just marijuana, uh, same mortality rate as everybody else, but they might actually have stronger lung function. And I think that's a study that needs to be replicated. But apparently there are studies that show people who are chronic marijuana smokers have better lung function. So if you're vaping because you think it's safer, it might be, but you're not, you're not on the side of science, you're just guessing. If you wanna be using the thing which has been studied the most, and consistently shown to have you know, little or no um, issues beyond the ones that you know about, then smoking is probably safer. Uh, and then the last thing that's the biggest mistake people make is they say to themselves, well, I don't know about all this smoking because I don't know how to do it or I don't want to get that high or I don't want to smell like smoke, whatever reasons. And they say, I think I'll, I'll play it safe and I'll, I'll just get an edible, I'll eat a brownie or something. Those people make up, I'm just guessing, but probably 90% of all the bad things you've ever heard about people under the influence of marijuana, probably 90% are from edibles. And it's always the same reason, that you can't tell your dose. You, you don't know how much you're getting, and because it kicks in slowly, you, you start chewing on the brownie, and because you're not smart, and, and by the way, I would fall into this category as well. It doesn't matter how smart you are, people make the same mistake. They would eat it and they'd say, huh, I don't really feel that different. I was hoping to feel different, so I'll eat another brownie. And they're like, eh, I feel a little bit. It's been 45 minutes. Yeah, I can feel a little bit, but I was hoping for more. I'll, I'll have a third brownie. And that's when you start taking your clothes off and driving on the wrong side of the road. So, um, don't do edibles. You know, even if you only do one, you don't know how much is in there unless you made it yourself and you're used to making it and you know what the what type of weed is in there and uh, edibles are just bad business. Stay away from them. Tell us why hypnotics are bad. Um, yeah, hypnotics is a class of pharmaceuticals like Ambien that put you into sleep, basically. So it just closes down your mind and puts you to sleep. 
Now, um, the only reason I say that's bad is not based on science, because um, I'm not aware of all the science, but the fact that anything that makes your brain shut down, you know, if, if, if it's not happening before major surgery, um, I, I just have questions whether that could ever be a good thing. Um, the volcano is another form of vaping that I would also not assume is safe. Because again, there, there have been, those things are newer, so there have been fewer, fewer kinds of uh, tests. You know people addicted to Ambien? Somebody said, am I productive when high? Well, I wrote my last two books while I was pretty high. They came out okay. Um, so let me, uh, let me give you a more responsible answer to that. Uh, my experience has been that the right marijuana will make people uh, more of what they already are. So if you're already creative and you have the right strain of marijuana and it's the, you know, the, right, the right minute after you've done it because you can't wait too long, you don't want to do it right away, there's, there's sort of a sweet spot in there, they can make you more creative. Uh, I would say that at least... I'd say 75% of the topics that you see me do on Periscope, I at least conceived of um, under the influence. And, it, and it's things that I would not have conceived of uh, under ordinary circumstances. So if you ask me, does it make you more creative? I would say there's a very big depends. You would first of all probably have to be a chronic user because if it was the first time you used it, you're, you know, you wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't be able to operate the same way. Uh, so you'd have to be a, a chronic user. And since I don't recommend anybody be a chronic user, unless you have, you know, legitimate medical uses, uh, I can't recommend it. And next, you'd have to take the right strain, because if you don't get the right strain, you don't get the creative feeling. You just get tired or paranoid or something else. Um, and you have to have the right kind of job where it makes sense. My job, the, the hardest part of my job is coming up with a new way to look at things. So in my specific case, um, I check all the boxes. So I do know what strain to use. You know, I am a chronic, chronic meaning daily user. Um, I do use it for medical purposes, so I would be using it anyway. You know, I wouldn't recommend you do it just to be creative, but since you, I'm using it anyway, it's, it's just a bonus. Um, and yeah, that's, that's the main thing. You, I check all the boxes, but most people would not. Somebody says Thomas Jefferson smoked weed. I once tried to look that up, and I think that is not confirmed. I believe that the the idea that the founders smoked weed comes from the fact that at least George Washington, maybe others, they they grew hemp as a crop. But I don't believe it was the THC type of hemp. I think it was you know a variant that is just good for making fabrics and stuff. Somebody says, "Why not use to be more creative by itself?" Let me clarify what I said. I'm not a doctor, so I would never recommend that anybody use marijuana. It doesn't matter what you said or you wanted to use it for, my answer is the same. Am I, am I a doctor yet? No. Is marijuana a medicinal thing? Yes. So cartoonists should not be giving you medical advice. So independent of whether or not it would be good to use it for your creativity, I would not recommend it because I'm not a doctor. John Cox thinks marijuana users should be hospitalized. Really? Did, well, did uh, John Cox say anything about dispensaries? Yeah, that doesn't sound like it's true. Um, how does it help me medically? In so many ways, it's hard to, it's hard to uh, even list them all, but it's good for sleep apnea. 
It eliminates my um, my allergies like no other pharmaceutical does, and it does it immediately. So it clears up my head. I can breathe better. It's an anti-inflammatory, so I can I can exercise far more efficiently. You know, it's not an accident. Um, I, I'm trying to say this next thing without being a giant douchebag, but I'm hoping that most of you know me well enough that I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna power through this. So the next thing I'm gonna say is very douchey, but in order to make my point, I don't know how to get there any other way. Um, I'm 60 years old, and I'm in phenomenal shape for my age. Now I'm not, I, I don't mean phenomenal like, uh, like the people who run Ironman. I mean for just a guy who is not a Ironman athlete or something, I'm in ridiculously good shape. And I would say that uh, a huge part of that is medicinal marijuana. Now, I don't take it for that purpose, but because it's an anti-inflammatory, I can work out, I don't get sore, it makes me want to work out the next day, it makes me enjoy it, so I enjoy it, etc. <laughs> Somebody says, you look old for your age. Well, uh, I, I make no claims about my face, which is the part you get to see. Uh, I, there's no bragging about my face. From from about here up, this is all bad news, all right? So I, I would love to be more narcissistic and say, you know, this is pretty good, but you know, I live in the real world. However, from here down, just in terms of fitness, etc., I'm pretty good shape. All right. Um, it lowers testosterone levels. I think temporarily it does that. Uh, <laughs> Persuade us. <laughs> Can we address the giant fish in the room? Uh, well, I have a roommate who's a giant fish. Um, lemon haze. That's the answer to the question. To the person who knows what that question was, the answer is lemon haze. All right. Um, what's my take on McCabe? I'm a little bit end of the news. I haven't been following it as much because I'm on the road. But um, my understanding is he asked for immunity, right? McCabe asked for immunity. Um, I, that's one of those legal questions. So I think you know my rule on legal questions. Anybody? Tell me, what is my rule about legal questions and opinions on them? Somebody will tell you here in a moment. Yes, it's the Alan Dershowitz rule. Correct. My rule on stuff like this is that until Alan Dershowitz tells me what to think, I'm just wasting my time. Because he's going to be the one who's the smartest one in the room, as usual, and he'll have an opinion. And when he goes on Fox or CNN and gives his opinion, then I'll come on here and say, you know, I've got an opinion on this now. Coincidentally, it matches Alan Dershowitz. There's big news breaking on Comey. What's that? Um... I'm just looking at your uh, comments, see if there's anything else we need to talk about before I go, and I think not. Oh, let me, let me, let me run this by you. Suppose that one of these investigations, and I, th I think Hillary's email is back into the investigative pipeline, right? Is that true? Can somebody confirm that, that there's somebody, somebody in law enforcement somewhere who's looking into the... Uh, is it just the IG? So suppose we get to a point where Hillary is in serious legal trouble, but not for things that are unlike what we already suspect. Let, let's say hypothetically that the, the only crime involved is, at least that's been proven, is that she had a, a server, an email that was not you know, within the, uh, the government's requirements, and it was illegal. What if that was her only crime, 
but it's definitely a crime, right? Everybody would agree. There's no question it's a serious crime. Should Trump pardon her even before going to jail? I think you could do that, right? You have to wait for the conviction or can you, can you pre-pardon? I'm not sure how that works. But again, I'd have to wait for Alan Dershowitz. So, um, so I'm looking at your answers. So there's some, a sprinkling of yeses, but it looks like a few more noes. Um, let me make the argument for yes to pardon her. Are you ready for it? Sets a good precedent. <laughs> you remember when, uh, when Trump started talking about uh, pardoning uh, Blago or whatever it is, the, the Democratic governor? And people were thinking, what? Why, why, why is that even on the radar? And that's one of those pardons. If, if he pardons a Democrat for something that was clearly looked like a crime, but it also had some political overtones, you know, there, there's sort of an argument that there, it was a little bit politicized, but I don't know exactly how that makes sense. Um, it sets a precedent. Because if, if Trump needs to pardon somebody who might be closer to Trump and who might be a Republican, wouldn't it be nice to have a Hillary pardon in his back pocket that he's already issued? Wouldn't it? For purely defensive reasons, pardoning Hillary would be a great play. Here's what else it would do. Heads would explode because nobody would expect it. And maybe you'd expect it now because I said it. But the country would expect that Trump would be mean old Trump the dictator and that he would be jailing his political opponent. The smartest thing he could do is to say, yep, she broke the law. Ordinary people go to jail for this. But I don't want to be part of putting my political opponent who lost in jail because I can. I think it would be an amazing, strong play. Um, and more importantly, even Hillary's supporters who think, oh, okay, if you broke the law, you gotta pay the, pay the penalty. Even the ones who know she broke, broke the law, hypothetically, if she did, um, they would feel very uncomfortable living in this country if that happened. So I'm gonna go on record as saying that if, if uh, facts come out that make uh, Hillary look like there's something seriously like jail time at risk, uh, whatever the process is, whether you have to wait for the conviction before you pardon, I'm not sure how that works. But uh, I would recommend, and strongly, strongly I would recommend a pardon. Strongly. I don't think this one's a close call, honestly, because the, the you know, the president can pardon anybody he wants. He has this, you know, unconditional power, uh, yeah, at least for federal stuff. And uh, giving a pardon because it's good for the country, forget about the person, it's just good for the country. It's more of a healing thing. Definitely the right play. Those of you who say no mercy, you're not thinking of your own self-interest. I would encourage you to think more selfishly. Yeah, th those who are saying, no, I'm so mad, lock her up, lock her up. Um, if the only crime is this email stuff and nothing else comes out of any consequence, it's not in your best interest, you as a citizen, that she goes to jail. Because there's gonna be, you know, there would be revolution. I mean, that, that would be, you know, I think even a lot of Republicans would be very squeamish about that. I'll bet you members of Congress, I'll bet you Republicans in Congress would have a real hard time with her going to jail because, you know, it's just bad for the country. Yeah, now, and those of you who are saying, hey, it's equal law and everybody has to be treated the same, um, that's not true. You know why that's not true, that there's equal justice and everybody should be treated the same? Let me tell you, that's not the system we live in. It wasn't designed that way. 
we were not designed to have equal, uh, equal justice. If we were designed that way, the president would not have the right to pardon. The whole point of the right to pardon is that you're giving unequal justice to some select people. That's built right into the system. So if people, if some, if the president uses the system the way it's designed and using powers they have given him for just this sort of thing, that there's a good reason this time you've got to pardon somebody. There was a, maybe a serious miscarriage of justice and the, the legal system isn't fixing it. Maybe it's just better for the country. Uh, we don't live in a system that has equal justice under the law. And more importantly, it's specifically designed to prevent equal justice. It's made that way by really smart people who knew what they were doing. There are no accidents here. We don't have legal, le equal justice. We don't want it. The system wasn't designed that way. And you wouldn't want that to change. And I realize it would make you unhappy, but uh, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. All right, I think that's enough for today. I'm going to say have a good day, and maybe I'll talk to you tomorrow.